Welcome to our final day together in this session of Psalms for the spring. Um, I don't know about you, but the two months have flown by pretty quickly, right? Um, and I pray and hope that we've all grown not only in our knowledge of God's Word, but in our affection for it um, and in our ability to apply it to our lives. I pray that you've been reminded that Scripture is sufficient for all things. It's sufficient for your fears, for your pain, for your loneliness, for your every emotion. And Scripture can train our heart and mind to desire God's glory in all of the ups and downs of life on this earth. And so before we dig into Psalm 57 here, I just want to encourage you to make a plan to stay in God's Word after we are apart for a few months here. Um, I'm going to make this announcement again at the end of the time in case there's people that come in later. But we have a gift for you in the back. There's a book that we're going to be giving out that Patty mentioned when she taught Psalm 23. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. So grab one of those on your way out and maybe just make a plan to meet up with a friend and read it together, talk about it, discuss it. Um, I would also encourage you maybe to go back and reread the Psalms that we've already studied this past semester. Um, you can't study it too much. You're never going to fully grasp everything that the Psalms says and teaches us. So um, just reading through the Psalms would be a good guide for your prayers for yourself. And we will pick back up in September. And I'm going to make a little more announcement about that at the end of the time. But we, um, So keep your workbooks so that you can, in a safe place where you can find them again in September. That's what happens to me. Where did I put that book that was so important that I need? So make sure you dust it off and have it ready to go. So... Um, Psalm 57, I want to read this out loud together before we begin. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge, till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills His purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out His steadfast love and His faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So, this psalm is written by David. And we actually have a lot of info that's given to us right there in that little title area or that subscript. And in the ESV, it reads, Let your glory be over all the earth. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a mictum of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Um, the words Do Not Destroy there are a plea to God to rescue David as he is being pursued by Saul. This psalm is literally David just pouring out his heart and his soul to God. He's crying out to him in a gut-wrenching emotional way. There's really no way that I could read that out loud in a dramatic fashion that would that would accurately convey how desperate David is in this time. Um, psalm 57 is categorized as a psalm of lament. A psalm of lament. And we don't use that word a lot, but a lament means to cry out to God, often in grief or fear or extreme sadness. If you've ever read through the Bible, like, like a read the Bible through a year plan, I always kind of start struggling when you get to the book of Lamentations. Right? Okay. The book of Lamentations is not a lighthearted fun, encouraging read, right? It's full of lament. It is sorrowful. It is desperate. It is intense. But even in lamentation, we can bring glory to God. And that's the goal here today as we break this psalm down together. Our title that I gave it today is Crying to God with Confidence. Crying to God with Confidence. And that's what we're going to see David doing here in this psalm. And although it, at times this psalm reads kind of like an emotional roller coaster, we will see that even in the midst of David's fear and in the midst of his lamenting, he keeps coming back to preach truths about God to himself. He keeps coming back to preach truths about God to himself. And we've talked in general about the Psalms and the different types of Psalms that there are, right? There are Thanksgiving Psalms, 
Last week, Alana taught on confession, psalms of confession. Um, there are wisdom psalms, praise psalms. But interestingly, the lament psalms are the, the most that we see in psalms. There are over 60 psalms of lament out of 150. So crying out in mourning and grief is common to man, right? It's common. Um, David and the other psalmists were real people living in a real world with real problems, with real pains, with real sorrows. And they got, just like us, they got confused. Um, They became doubtful. They were disoriented in their faith at times in the face of trials. And yet they laid their souls bare before the Lord and they lamented. And they're an example for us in that. So laments typically answer three basic questions. They answer who, why, and what. Who is there to hear my prayer? Why am I experiencing this problem? And what do I want God to do about it? And you'll see these three questions asked in this psalm. One writer said that lament psalms are kind of like those days we all have where physically everything seems to go wrong. You know, you wake up in the morning, you're cranky. You might be in a hurry. You spill coffee on your white shirt. Everybody needs something from you. You're about at your tipping point, and then right when you think you can take no more, you stub your toe hard on something as you're walking out the door. And you literally want to just crumple onto the ground and go, why? Why is this happening right now? I don't need this. That is what the Psalms of Lament are like for your soul. It is your soul crying out. When your heart is weary, when your faith is weak, when your trust in God's sovereignty is precarious, and then one more thing happens to discourage you, and you cry out, why, Lord? Why? What is your purpose in this? I can't see it. The laments are honest, humble cries of how the psalmist feels about life. They are written in tears, but they often end in joy. And we're going to see two distinct halves to this particular psalm of David. So you have two main points on your hand out there. In verses 1 through 6, we're going to see David's cry for help. This is his complaint, his earnest, honest prayer to God. And then in verses 7 to 11, we'll see his prayer turn to praise and his cries turn to confidence in his God. David wrote this psalm, as I said earlier, when he was fleeing from Saul and hiding in a cave. And there are actually, believe it or not, in the book of 1 Samuel, there are two accounts of David hiding in two different caves from Saul. And there are debates about which one this particular psalm is referring to, but that doesn't really matter today for our purposes, right? We don't need to know which cave it was. The point is that he's in a cave. He's not in a good spot in his life. It's pretty much a low point for David, right? He's running for his life and hiding in caves from Saul because Saul is in a jealous rage over David being anointed king in his place and God blessing David over him. Saul wants to murder David, and so he's hiding in a cave. Verse 1, David cries out, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. And he repeats that phrase, be merciful, be merciful, right away. This plea is urgent. David is being hunted like an animal. Now, we live in a different time, and obviously the things that we deal with and that we feel anxious about kind of pale in comparison to being hunted down in a cave. But... You know, I'm I'm a very, I'm kind of a wimpy person. Um, Don't be surprised, I know. But um, I get like secondhand fear for people. Like I I can't watch or be involved in anything where someone's doing something death defying, even like on the television. I will get like sweaty palms. I'll start sweating. I'm clammy. I can't watch any of those things that cause physical anxiety. Um, But David is not secondhand fear. He is not watching something play out on a television show. David is physically, mentally, and emotionally experiencing the overwhelming fear of someone hunting him down. And not only just Saul, but he has thousands of people in his army that have all been trained and told to kill David when they see him. So David literally has every physical reason to be afraid, right? And to cry out to God for mercy. But almost as soon as he cries for mercy and says he's afraid... David declares the truth that he knows, and that is that God is his refuge. The Hebrew word for refuge means a shelter, a place of protection or safety. And while David knows, and while David's in this cave being physically hunted and being protected from his hunter, he knows that the refuge for his soul, the ultimate place of safety for him is his heavenly father. In his time of certainty, David says, God, you alone are my refuge, my safety. We are safe in the shadow of his wings. 
Um, you might not know this about me, but I, I, I don't like birds, and I don't really like talking about anything bird-related. So verses about birds are hard for me, but it, it is really a powerful picture, as this verse says, that God is like a mother hen who covers with his wings, right? He covers us and protects us. Many of you know, um, I've told my story several times here about my struggles with um, anxiety, and I will say, I call it sinful fear um, in my past. And one lesson among many that I learned during those dark times is that the more I sought security and safety in things other than the Lord, the more insecure and unsafe I felt. The more I felt, the more I sought safety and security in things that weren't the Lord, the more unsafe and insecure I felt. God wants us to seek him as our refuge and our only refuge. Verse 1 tells us that the storms of destruction will pass, meaning they won't last forever. But our security in the Almighty God is for eternity if we are in Christ. Verse 2, David continues his prayer and he says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. And here is where you can see that David is actually making himself pray. Okay? Have you ever done that? Have you ever... He's, David is verbally stating what he knows to be true, even though he doesn't feel it at the moment. And this is a good practice. I recommend it if you've never done this. In your moments of doubt and fear, pray to God out loud if you can. David acknowledges that God is not just God, but he is the most high God. He's over all things. He acknowledges and reminds himself that God is the highest in authority. God is the highest in power. No one supersedes him. No one outranks him. Even from the bowels of a cave, David says, God is fulfilling his purpose for me, and I believe that. The God who is most high is fulfilling his purposes for me, and that purpose that God is going to fulfill for David is that he's going to make him the king of Israel. And even though it probably doesn't seem like it to David in that very particular moment, David trusts God's character, and it gives him confidence as he sits in this dark cave. We remember God's faithfulness to us in the past, and we patiently wait for his future mercy. And so we pray. We think about Romans 8 that tells us that we're adopted as his sons if we're in Christ. And through the Spirit, we can cry to our Abba Father when we're afraid. David cries out to God here with confidence. In verse 4, David describes his situation by saying that his fleeing from Saul and the Philistines is like lying down in the midst of lions. So we see David here kind of like we see Daniel in the lion's den. He's in the very midst of danger, and yet his faith in God makes him feel so secure that he says, I can lie down in the middle of these lions and go to sleep peacefully. When we have God as our defender, we can rest. Do you believe that? When you have God as your defender, you can rest. Isaiah 26, 3. I had this verse taped next to my, where I laid my head at night in my college dorm room um, that says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I've struggled and I still often do to find that feeling of safety. And time and time again, I'm reminded through God's word that the safest place to be is where God has me. I can lie down and rest because God has me. We can live our lives in the middle of a world held hostage by fear in the midst of a pandemic because we are kept under his wings. He is fulfilling his purposes for us and we can trust him. David says at the end of verse 4 that his enemies are fiery beasts and their teeth are like spears and arrows and their tongues like sharp swords. They wanted to physically kill him, but also they used their words to attack him as well. The next part of David's prayer is kind of surprising because he's crying for mercy and he's explaining how fierce and terrifying these enemies are. And then he asks God for something. And he doesn't ask him to protect him. He doesn't ask him to deliver him. He asks God to exalt himself. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. This is the deepest desire of David's heart. God's glory. He wants God to rescue him so that the whole world will see how glorious God is. And this phrase is going to be repeated at the end of the chapter. And even in the structure of this psalm, this prayer is a chorus. It's at the middle of the psalm, and it's repeated at the end of the psalm. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. In verse 6, David speaks about these traps that Saul has set for him. He says, they set a net for my steps. Everywhere he turned, there was a trap set for him. He says his soul is bowed down, meaning he was discouraged. His enemies wanted him to have no comfort and to feel ensnared at every turn. 
They dug a pit for me, he says, but they have fallen into it themselves. Um, Pits were often dug by hunters in the path of their prey, and God had allowed Saul more than once to be caught by his own schemes. If you remember in the Old Testament account in 1 Samuel, David actually had more than one opportunity to kill Saul, and he spared him. One time he was in the cave, and he cut off the bottom of his robe and showed it to him later and said, I could have killed you, and I didn't. Spurgeon says about this verse in Psalm 57 that evil is a stream which one day flows back to its own sources. So now we transition from David's cry, or you could even say your own cry, if you're using this as a model for your prayer, and we see David's mindset mindset shift to one of confidence. You can tell in this psalm that his mood actually changes. You can hear in his tone that David knows that God will carry him through this trial, and he suddenly becomes more concerned with proclaiming God's faithfulness than the fear that he's feeling. Verse 7 says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. And I picture myself back at that bad day that I described at the beginning. And this is the point where maybe everything has gone wrong. You're collapsed on the floor. Why God? Why me? And then you wipe off your tears and you start speaking truth to yourself. David says, I'm going to praise you, God. I will sing and make melody. You are worthy. I trust you. My heart is steadfast. Some translations say here, my heart is fixed. The enemy is not going to shake me. Surrounded by killers, hiding in a cave, no way out, David says, I worship you, God. His heart is strong because he trusts God's promises and he trusts God's character. He comforts his own soul with truth and resolves to be calm and secure when he has every earthly reason to be anxious and fearful. Verse 8 says, Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. This is an interesting verse, and I didn't get it at first, but three times David is telling himself to wake up. To use every alert bone and muscle in your body to magnify the Lord. This high and noble duty of worship should be done from David's most alert state. He says he wants to awake the dawn. He wants the sun to rise and find him on his knees praising God. This doesn't mean that the only biblical way to do your devotions is first thing in the morning. But it's God's way of saying that our top priority should be to worship him. Spurgeon says we should sing with excited grace. David's heart of excited grace flows right into the next verse, verse 9, where he declares that he will give thanks to God among the peoples, and he will sing praises to him among the nations. You have to keep remembering where David is when he's writing this. And I know that I have sung songs many times, standing in the safety and security of our church, singing songs about how how I will tell all the nations and how I will sing his praise to the end of the earth, but I've never done it in a cave with someone hunting me down. David tells his heart to be thankful even before he has been delivered. He trusted in the covenant promises of God so much that he knew he could be grateful in advance for what God was going to do. He wanted God to be exalted through his deliverance. Again, we're brought back to David's greatest desire, giving God glory. And what's amazing to think about is that David was a part of the worldwide spread of God's glory. That was his prayer, and it was part of the covenant promise that someone in his lineage would one day exalt God's name and spread his glory over the earth. And like David, Jesus, who was the heir to David's throne, he suffered at the hands of people that wanted to destroy him too, didn't he? And just like David, Jesus was delivered from his enemies when his father raised him from the dead, vindicating his life and ministry and proving that his death for sinners accomplished its purpose and satisfied the father's wrath. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, God's name is exalted above the heavens and his glory is spreading over all the earth. David encourages his own heart by meditating on God's character. In verse 10, he says, For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Um, One commentary writer said that when David reigns over Israel, all the nations will see God's glory and the goodness of the reign of the new Adam. And that's Christ. The one made in God's image and likeness will reign like the one whose image he bears. Thus, God's loving kindness and truth will be made manifest in the reign of his king. God's loving kindness saturates the atmosphere, reaching to the heavens, and his truth does likewise to the clouds. All creation is pervaded with the glory of God's character. Imagine that day, all creation being pervaded and consumed by the glory of who God is. David finishes this psalm with the chorus that he sang in verse 5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Hamilton goes on to say, When God is gracious to David... David's enemies will be defeated. 
His throne will be established and the knowledge of God's character and glory will spread over all the earth. If not in David's lifetime, then in the life of the king God promised to raise up from his line. And that was Jesus Christ. This king, this Messiah that we know would be called Jesus, also understood that while God had specific plans and purposes for him and his life on this earth, even in that, God, God's ultimate commitment was to his own glory. We see this in the book of John. If you read chapters 12 through 17 of the book of John, you'll read of Jesus repeatedly praying for one thing. Glorify yourself. Glorify yourself through me. In John 13, 21, we read about the Last Supper. And Jesus is sitting there reclining and eating with all of his disciples, right? And he tells one of them that, tells them all that one of them is going to betray him. And Peter asks him, who is it, Lord? Who's going to betray you? And Jesus takes a piece of bread and he dips it in the wine. And he says, the person that I'm going to give this to is the person that's going to betray me. And of course, we know he gives it to Judas. But immediately after this, Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. There is not a more beautiful or clear picture of God's glory than in the death and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. And here's where I want to turn this to applying this to our own hearts and minds. Because if we correctly know how to apply this psalm to our life, it should transform the way we pray. It should transform the way we pray. One of the sermons I listened to in preparation for this week was called The Fear You Feel Versus the God You Know. The Fear You Feel Versus the God You Know. And I think that's such a great description of our life in this fallen world because this is the battle every single day, right? Every day is a battle with our emotions, with our feelings, with the circumstances around us. And we have to battle those things with what we know is true about God, right? We have to talk to ourselves more than we listen to ourselves. Psalm 57 starts with a cry, but it ends with confidence. We see David start at the beginning talking about his suffering, and by verse 11 he's talking about God's glory. From lament to praise. And we've talked about this a little bit before, but many of the Psalms, and really the entire book of Psalms, which we call the Psalter, is a picture of the life of Christ, right? Jesus' life, it moves from suffering to glory. He bore the cross before he wore the crown, and in many ways that applies to our lives as well. We are not promised a life of ease on this earth. We will walk through trials and pain, and you might even suffer persecution for his name. But our inheritance awaits us in heaven. And we know that because of the promises of the gospel, we can live lives of joy right now, faithfully following him, and know that there is glory coming for us one day. His glory is what we're going to get. It's our inheritance, but it's also our mission right now to spread his glory. So I just want to end this time together by asking you and asking myself two questions for self-examination. I think this is on the back side of your paper. The first question I want us to ask ourselves is, are you looking to Christ? Are you looking to Christ in the midst of whatever you are facing, in the moments of overwhelming fear, when you are sinfully anxious and looking to the world to make you feel safe, are you looking to Christ? There are times in our lives where all we can do is lament. All we can do is mourn. Um, maybe some of you are there right now. Maybe some of you have walked through that in the past and had those moments when all you can muster is grief and all you can do is cry out to God and say, why? But we can't stay there, right? If we keep our eyes on ourselves and our circumstances, we will sink. But even if your eyes are filled with tears, look to Christ. He deserves your praise even in the darkness. The world wants us to think of ourselves as victims, to blame everyone else for our problems, but victimhood is an obstacle to glorifying God, which is our highest goal. You can cry, you can mourn, you can grieve, but don't be caught in self-pity. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The fear you feel can only be overcome by the God you know. And I know I sound like a broken record because I say this every time, but the only way that we know God and the only way that we can learn to trust in his character is to be in his word. Do you ever see people you know that are going through incredibly hard things and wonder how can they praise God in the middle of that? It's because they know God. They know him through his word. When you hear people struggling with su and suffering with anxiety and depression all around us, we have one answer. Look to Christ. Point them to the scriptures. Are you looking to Christ? And the second question I have for us today is, are we living for God's glory? Are we living for God's glory? 
David was thinking of God's glory constantly. From the recesses of a cave, he was praying that God's name would be held high. And as much as I say, I want to glorify God with my life, there can be significant amounts of time in my life where I don't think of that at all. Um, there are, I have a busy, nonstop, chaotic life filled with teenagers and emotions and drama. I have a very dysfunctional extended family. My dad is currently going through brain cancer treatments. My mom is his only caretaker. Of course, I'm bringing these things to the Lord in prayer. Of course, I'm praying about those things, and I'm asking God for wisdom, and I'm asking God to sustain us and to do His will. But I have to admit that I do not know how often I begin or end my prayers with, Be exalted, O God. Would you be exalted? That's not always the cry of my heart. That's not always what I want the most in response to my prayers. But everything we do in our Christian life should be for this purpose. And yet we so easily become short-sighted in our prayers. We desperately want our trials to end right? And we might even want to see people turn to Christ and be saved. But why? One of our pastors spoke last week on Sunday on Philippians 2 and how um, Paul calls us to unity in the church for God's glory. Paul calls us to live a life worthy of our calling in Ephesians 4. Why? For God's glory. Why should we cry out to God when we're afraid? Why should we gather together on Sundays? Why should you serve in the nursery? Why should you make meals for people that need them? And why should you aim to live a life that is others-centered? For God's glory. So my prayer for each of you and for myself as we part ways, for however long it is, is that we would all think about God's purpose for our lives. That like David, we would be more concerned with God's glory than we are with our own fears. I pray that we would beg beg God to make His glory known through us, by keeping us faithful when we suffer, that he would complete the good work he began in us, and that one day he would present us blameless before himself because of our faith in Christ. We can cry to God with confidence, knowing that everything is for his glory. And I just want to end by reading two verses from the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25, which says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, be majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that um, there's nowhere else that we could go other than your word. We thank you that you are steadfast, that you are faithful, that you hold us fast in the midst of our trials, Lord. And I pray that as we grow And as we learn to trust you more for who you are, I pray that that time between our crying out and our confidence would shorten every day, Lord. That even in our grief, even in our sorrow, even in our fear, that we would immediately turn to you with confidence and say, I trust you. Um, And not only that we trust you, Lord, but that our deepest desire would be that you would be glorified in our responses that people could look at our lives and see how we handle horrific trials and terribly hard things and could say, because that person's been changed by Christ, I see that they trust Him that, and that they give Him glory and that they, in turn, want to serve Him and glorify them, Him all their days, Lord. I pray for these ladies. I thank you for their faithfulness. I pray that they would encourage one another in their time together today um, and that you would be honored and glorified above all things. In your name, amen. So before you go, I just want to reiterate, when we get back together in the fall, we'll still be using this book, okay? Obviously, like, new people can get books and things like that, but you keep this one you have. And just to kind of clarify so we don't get confused, if you really did faithfully do every single one of your days of homework from seven days a week, then you would have probably ended on Psalm 63. But when we come back in the fall, I plan on starting right here, which says 61, which would be good for you if you did your homework, you'd have two days already done, okay? I did not do that. So this is where we'll start in the fall. It's the second book of Psalms. How many? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So um, Psalm 61, that's where we'll start in the fall. We will have some summer book clubs. We'll have recommended reading. We'll have things like that. So keep an eye out. That will be coming to you in an email probably in the next month or so.